morning, good morning, happy Sunday. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is your first time hanging with us, and you found us online. Uh, my name is Christopher, one of the pastors here. I get the, the uh, beautiful privilege of helping lead this, this community of Jesus people. And um, this week is a little bit unusual, uh, out of the ordinary for us, for, for me. Um, we had uh, a very um, interesting uh, week, to say the least, if you're wondering why we're online and not in person, meeting in person. Last week, uh, we celebrated, it was so beautiful and powerful, our eight-year anniversary, and uh, it was a great time being with God's people, first time that we got to gather inside as a church in the last year and a half. Uh, but with that uh, came the unexpected exposure of COVID um, that has led to uh, a handful of folks in our church um, being infected with COVID, and uh, some are, are doing okay, and, and some are, uh, are not doing that well uh, with the infection through the pain and difficulty of what this brings. And uh, so, yeah, it has been, um, been a wild week. Uh, it's not anything out of the ordinary to, to talk about COVID. I'm sure you're probably sick and tired of thinking about it and talking about it. Most of America and the world is it won't go away, but it is a reality, and uh, we did experience it for the first time corporately together. And um, I know it has been for some people um, scary. It has been um, a reason to be anxious. It has brought fear and uncertainty and pain and a lot of problems with this week. Um, and my heart is just heavy. My heart is heavy. Uh, knowing that some of you, people whom I love, are are sick. Um, I feel it in my own home. My wife uh, got infected, so she has it. And one of my kids, uh, my daughter has it as well. And so I'm dealing with it personally on my front. And uh, I know many of our folks are dealing with it as well. And it's just not enjoyable. Uh, it's not enjoyable. Um, and so I know it's a very odd week. Uh, but this morning, uh, Sunday, I wanted to... Uh, be able just to share with you God's word, because I know that we're coming in to this morning. Some of us are coming in not feeling affected by this, and we're just going on with our lives. And some of us, are our lives have been turned upside down for this week or in the foreseeable future from this. So I know there's a, there's a large spectrum with people on different sides, and I want to be, um, I want to be patient with that and and empathetic and sympathetic with the fact that uh, we're all wrestling through this. And so what I want to do, and before we move into just the scriptures, to be able to lift our eyes up towards Jesus, which I need and I'm sure you need as well, I want to spend a moment praying for those who have been affected, who are sick in our church. And as I pray, as I pray here in the office, I would ask that you would pray at home, with your by yourself, with your, with your family, or you're watching this later on this week, that you would pray, and that you would pray with this one perspective, that the God of this universe who spoke it all into existence is leaning forward, waiting for us to ask him to move. He's leaning forward, waiting for us to ask him to move. He is desiring to answer. And so let's take that posture this morning, and if you could think of those who are who are sick, who are in pain, who, are, um, who have reasons to be anxious because of their health, let's, let's cry out on behalf of them to the Lord um, and ask for God's healing. Father, we, we pause this morning and we, um, we just cry out on behalf of our brothers and sisters. We cry out asking for your mercy, Lord. We cry out asking that you would see our brothers and sisters who are sick. So like the many the millions of other people in this world, God, you know them and you know our people and you know that they are sick. And we ask God that you would move in with your life-giving spirit and reverse the pain, reverse the infection. God, would you bring healing where there is pain? Would you bring freedom from this infection where there is a weight? Would you bring peace where there is anxiety, God. I know some of us have, have lost friends and family members from this, and this is not anything to take lightly. And I know your heart, God, is burdened by the sinful world and the brokenness that it brings. 
the sickness that goes around. So God, we ask, because we know you're hearing us and you're leaning forward, that you would extend your healing hand to those who are sick. God, touch them, heal them, help them recover in a way that doctors can't even explain. We believe, God, you do miracles because miracles are just you bringing into existence the way creation was always supposed to be, without brokenness. So God, we cry out, move in power, bring healing, bring rest, bring peace, bring stillness to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, thank you for praying, church family. Continue to pray on our on our Slack channel. If you're a part of our church, we have a, a Slack channel where people are reaching out and sharing concerns and prayer requests. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in a moment uh, through this message, just this small devotional word. But um, yeah, I just, that's the word of this hour, to continue to pray that the Lord moves in ways that we can't, we can't conjure up in our own strength, in our own strength. Um, and so we're going to, uh, I'm going to share a quick word just to bring some encouragement to us, but I want to let you know, if I don't mention this at the end, that we are working on a plan to gather back next week safely. Uh, we understand that what we had last week with masks on and social distance, uh, we know that things happen. And even though we follow the rules, things happen, and they happen all around in schools and in restaurants and in all over the world is happening. So we're not going to let that stop us. We're not fearful. We are we are concerned and we're going to even heighten the way that we, we, we are aware of how to move through things, but we are certainly not fearful. And so we're going to move through that and uh, have a good plan for coming back safely that we'll email out in the next couple of days. But I want to turn our attention to God's word this morning. Hopefully, I don't know where you're at, whether you're anxious or tired, whether you've been up all week, all night, or you're just doing fine. But um, I want to share just a quick devotional thought from something that I read earlier this week. And uh, if, if you had a title for it, I guess it simply would say, uh, peace when you are perplexed. Peace when you are perplexed. I don't know what you, but I have found myself perplexed, kind of confused and not knowing how to think through things this week at times um, with the burden of leading through this and figuring out what to do and knowing that there's so many people who are sick um, it's heavy, it's perplexing. And so we're going to be in Philippians 4. Philippians 4, uh, I want to start out with verse 7. It's the end of the passage, and I want you to see the promise that Paul has for us. Verse 7, chapter 4 says this, And the peace of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Whether it's this week with COVID, whether it's relationships, whether it's family, whether it's work or finances or, or sin, we all have need for peace. I, I would imagine the best way to define peace um, would be something like this, that the stillness of the soul in the midst of a storm. The stillness of a soul, the stillness of your soul, when it's tempted to be anxious and torn and tossed and divided and frantic, that peace allows you to be calm and still in times when you shouldn't be calm and still. I want that. I want that peace, and I want you to have peace. I want us to look at just three steps that Paul says here. Really simple. Three steps that Paul says that helps us put our gaze into the kingdom reality of Jesus so that we would have peace in the midst of times when things don't make sense, when things are annoying and, and burdensome and heavy and hard and depressing or um, just, just, just difficult. I want us to look at the scripture. So we're going to start uh, with this question. How do we obtain this peace in the midst of the present uncertainty? And we're going to look at uh, this. I want to read through Philippians 4 with you, uh, starting at chapter 4, verse 4. He says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We're, we're going to work through this passage, but I want to go line by line. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In a world filled with cynicism and Headlines that are filled with bad news and stats that are looking worse and crime that is up and all of the, the injustice and all the things that are tampering with the peace of our souls. Why have joy? Why? With all the things going on, how do we have joy? With a week like this, how do you find reasons to have 
joy, um, a couple of things that Paul says I think are so beautiful in this, if you're taking notes. Number one, we should have joy. He says this, he says, rejoice in the Lord always again. I will say rejoice. You might assume this, but we should have joy because of who Jesus is to us. I think of the prayer that uh, David writes in Psalm 51. This is after he sins with Bathsheba and he repents and he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Oh God, how powerful that is. And how often I lose the joy of salvation in the midst of thinking about all this other stuff. This morning, I want to encourage you. Remember that Jesus Christ has plucked you out of hell and you are no longer under the wrath of God. You are no longer condemned for one sin. There's nothing in your life in the future that you can ever sin and do wrong that God will hold you against because Jesus has taken that. Come on, that's a reason to rejoice. Restore the joy of salvation. What else do we need to rejoice in besides the fact that we are no longer going to hell? We will be in eternity with the King. Oh, I know that's simple. But can we stop and praise the Lord and have joy brim up in our souls because our eternity is secure, forgiven, bought by the blood of Jesus, plucked out of hell. But not just Jesus. One of the main ways that Paul rejoices in this letter, actually the only way really he connects joy to these verses that he talks about in this letter is with the people of God. Every time that Paul mentions joy, he's talking about the people in the church of Philippi. I love that. Not just that Jesus, who Jesus is to him, gives him joy, but also who the people are to him. Who the people are to him. All his connections of joy are connected to the people of God. He says this, that I get joy for being partners with you in the gospel. He says this in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I think one of the reasons why we can rejoice right now, one of the ways that we can find peace in the midst of perplexity is taking joy in the people of God around us. And church family, as your lead pastor, I find so much joy in you. Especially this week, seeing in the midst of a perplexing time how much you are serving one another, how well you love one another and are praying and are transparent and are caring and are crying out and are dropping off things and texting. And I take joy in you. You hopefully take joy, not just in Jesus, but in Jesus' gift of this Church, they are the extension of Christ's presence to us. You are the extension of Christ's grace to me, and I take joy. I rejoice in the Lord because of you, because of how well you love people, because of what you do day in and day out. I take joy when I think of you. I take joy when I pray for you. Hopefully, you take joy in the relationships that God has given you in this church. Are people perfect? No. Do people get under your skin? Do people get under my skin? Yes, but I have Hopefully maturity, you have the maturity to see past that. We all get under each other's skin because we're all sinful people in progress. But man, what a joy to be able to be a church family together. I thank God for you. I think I'm brought to joy by seeing you grow and love and serve. And I love what Paul says. He says, always have joy, always. Like in, in every circumstance, have joy. In every circumstance, you can have this defiant joy because of Jesus and people. No circumstance can take away Jesus and no circumstance can take away God's people. There will always be the church until Jesus returns. Are you thankful? Are you rejoicing because of the salvation of Jesus has plucked you out of hell? Are you rejoicing today? Can you rejoice because you have brothers and sisters, family around you that love you? and that are filled with God's Spirit and are walking with you in this journey. How do you obtain peace in perplexing situations? Number one, rehearse to yourself your reasons for joy. Rehearse to yourself your reasons for joy. You gotta run back the reasons why 
that you can rejoice. You got to stop. Stop making a list of reasons why life is hard. That's real. And start making a list of why life is beautiful. Why you can rejoice. Because I, I assume and I am convinced and confident that you can find reasons to rejoice. He goes on to say in verse 5, after rejoicing, he says this, Let your reasonableness, your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Hand. I love that. That's another way for Paul to say, the Lord's coming is near. The Lord's coming is near. It's soon. It's right around the corner. Now look, at, I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I'm not the prophet that's going to tell you he's coming back on this date or this time. The signs are looking like it. You can read the book of Revelation, but people have been saying that for, for thousands of years. So we don't know the day. But Paul's trying to get us the perspective that Jesus is coming back. Now, now you probably ask the question like I do, why does that matter right now? Like, why would Paul tell us now, presently suffering and distressed, now worrying about our lives, that Jesus is going to come back one day in the future? It's because of this. Paul's trying to get us to understand and receive the assurance that one day, Jesus will come back and make all sad things come untrue. He will make all things well. See, when we face times of difficulty and perplexity, you're facing times of uncertainty in your life. When trials come, often for me, my gaze is short-sighted. My head goes down and is fixated on the things that I am a dealing with in that moment. Inside of my head, I am trapped with seeing not ahead of me, but right in front of me. And all we can think about is today, not even tomorrow. We have a fear about tomorrow and we have anxiety about today. We lose perspective. But the return of Christ, Paul says, is a great reversal of all that has caused us pain and fear. Everything that has caused you and is causing you and I pain and fear now, when Christ comes back, that will all be reversed, undone. The return of Christ is the day we get to finally and fully see the face of Jesus. Can you just stop this morning and think that one day all the headlines will shift from tragedy and suffering and poverty and war and abuse and racism and, and all these horrible things to Christ has come back. Jesus has returned for his bride. Jesus has returned to gather up the people that have been going through pain and have been walking through exile. Come on, Jesus is coming back one day. And Paul says, lift your head a little bit and see just a little bit further that Jesus is coming back. I know you might think that it's way far off, but you gotta have the perspective that one day Jesus is coming back and oh, how sweet that day will be. The sweetness of that day in the future makes the pain today bearable. He wants us to lift our gaze out of the present trials, away from the present trials. Look, I know the middle of the story might be messy and uncertain. You're living in the middle of the story. I'm living in the middle of the story and it's messy and it's uncertain. I get that, but guess what? We know the end of the story. We know the end of the story. We know the beginning of the story. We're living in the middle and it's uncertain, but we know how it ends. How do you obtain peace in perplexing situations? Lift your gaze to the return of Christ. Jesus is going to come back, not as a suffering servant, but as a reigning king to conquer sin, death, Satan, and hell in the world and the flesh forever. And all the problems and the pain that weigh us down will no longer be present. That is how you get peace. Fixing your eyes on that day. Fixing your eyes on the return of Jesus. And then verse 6. Chapter 4, verse 6. Not only rejoice in the Lord, rehearse why you have reasons to rejoice in Jesus and in people. Not only, hey, the day of the Lord is coming, so think about outside of your present moment affliction and look at Christ coming back and how glorious that will be. But verse 6, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, supplication with thanksgiving, 
Let your requests be made known to God. Let your requests be made known to God. Look, at, I can imagine with a week like this and with any week or even this last year and a half that there are plenty of valid reasons for you and I to be anxious. At least we tell us ourselves valid reasons. It's been a rough week. It's been a rough year and a half. A lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people have lost friends and family. A lot of people have lost a sense of normalcy and rhythm in their life and a sense of knowing what to do and where to go next. It's been a season of loss and setbacks for many. And that breeds a lot of anxiety. Rightfully so. I get that. Trust me. Like I said earlier, I got, I'm leading through this the best I can and figuring out how to, how to make sense of this all and how to move forward while in my home also having my wife and kids dealing with this just as much as anyone else. And I get it. The anxiety for me is there is the worry or the concern it can be possibly rising up at times when I don't want it, figuring out how to work through this. It's interesting. The word anxiety literally means to be divided, like, like distracted with your concern. Like it's not almost a bad word in one sense because we need to have concern. We are humans that have worry in a good sense about things that we care about. But Paul is saying you have too much of it. You are continually being anxious, which means you're not just caring about Jesus. You're distracted and your care for Jesus and the things of God's kingdom are being lessened because you're caring about other things that aren't as important. Anxiety. It's heavy. And Paul is saying you're caring too much about this stuff in a toxic way. It's affecting you. But look at Paul's solution to anxiety. He doesn't say ignore the problem. He doesn't say ignore the problem. He doesn't say ignore reality. I love that. He's a realist. He doesn't say ignore the problem. And he doesn't say overlook the trial like, oh, it's just whatever. And he certainly doesn't say numb yourself to the pain, like just do something to to get through it. No, this is what Christianity is so unique that it has a different way of interacting with suffering and trials. Paul says, bring it all before the Lord in genuine prayer. Let your requests be made known to God. Be honest and real about what you need. It's kind of funny, right? Let your requests be made known to God. Jesus already said in Matthew, he said that Father knows what you need before you ask him. So, so what's the point of us making our request known to God? It's not that we are letting God know what we need. It's that we are making sure we're honest with what we need before God. Let me ask you this week, maybe, because this is the closest thing to us, so many of us, are you being honest about what you need? Like really honest with your fears and your complaints and your worries and your uncertainty, whether it's about this COVID issue or whether about anything else in life. Are you being honest before God? Are you really letting him know what you feel? If you read through the book of Psalms, uh, be careful. It is honest. Like people complain about God not being there when they need them, him. And God isn't rebuking anyone for their honesty. He invites honesty. He invites honesty. He can handle you crying out. He can handle your complaining. He can handle your worry and your anger. This is what we talked about last week at the end of our anniversary. The call that I feel the Lord calling us into this next season is to cry out with more desperation for God's presence and power. I'm just, the Lord just has me on a journey where I'm becoming more and more aware of my lack and more and more aware that I need to cry out because that's the only way that God works in my life in the major in the major ways and minor ways is when I humble myself and depend on him to do things. That's the way he gets the most glory. And we are a praying church, but the Lord is saying, that's great. You need to increase in that. Don't settle for what you're doing. Do more. Pray more. Believe more. Ask more. Cry out more. Be prostrate before the Lord more. Get on your knees more. Be honest more. I've learned this the hard way that if I'm not praying, I'm guaranteeing more anxiety, more pain, and more worry, more stress. I'm just guaranteeing that. It's not God's will for my life. It's just the way that it's like a law of gravity. When you jump up, you fall down. Well, if you're not praying, you're going to be crushed by the weight of anxiety because the way that we cast our burdens on the Lord is by throwing the burden on Him through prayer. And man, church, what better way this week than to work that out? And Paul says, with gratitude, like, don't come entitled. Don't make your request 
known before God without gratitude, because that's just like some prideful entitlement, like, God, you owe me this. No, no, he says, with gratitude, like, come humbly asking, humbly dependent and grateful that God has given you all these things and more and salvation, and he still wants to give you good gifts. How much more does the Father want to bless you? Jesus says in Luke. Believe that. That in prayer, God hears you and wants to move. I love how Hebrews explains faith. Faith isn't just believing that God exists, Hebrews says. It's believing that he rewards those who seek him. When we come to God in faith in prayer, we are believing that God is actually inclined, more inclined than we are actually needy of asking. He's inclined, bending over on his throne, waiting for us to knock so he can bless us. That is God. He's predisposed to bless us. We're not having to convince God of blessing us. We just need to be honest before him and keep asking him and he will deliver. He will bless us. I love this statement, this quote from a theologian. He said, the condition for experiencing God's peace is not that God grants all of our requests, but that we have made known all our requests to God with a heart of gratitude. God's peace is not the result of the power of our prayers or the effectiveness of our prayers, but the reality that the sovereign God knows our needs and will handle them in the best way possible. Look at I get peace not when God answers my prayers. Isn't that crazy? I get peace when I release my worries to God. And if, even if I don't get the problem fixed, I have peace. Why? Because the burden is no longer on me. It's on the Father who knows more than I know and who can do more than I can do. So what's the third way to obtain peace in the perplexing situations? Displace your self-talk of worry with God talk of requests. Displace your self-talk of worry, the self-talk of, oh, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm fearful. And that's self-talk. I talk myself up in worry and replace that with God talk of requests. Throw, cast, cast, cast. Peter says, cast a burden, cast your cares, cast your anxieties on the Lord because he cares for you. Church, man, I'm so thankful that God cares for me. He cares for you and he's waiting for you to throw that burden on him so he can shoulder it. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Like, take my yoke so I can, like, bear, bear the weight with you because my burden is light. If you're walking with Jesus and living in an intimate relationship with him, you shouldn't be crushed because he should be shouldering the weight. If you're not living and abiding in Jesus, then you're probably noticing that it's really heavy. And I've been there. It gets heavy. But the Lord promises a way to have Peace. Number one, rehearse your reasons for rejoicing. Maybe this morning you need to stop after this and we're going to wrap up in a few moments and just write out a list of reasons why you have joy, whether it's the salvation of Jesus and what that means for you, knowing that you're sinful and deserve hell, or whether it's specific people in this church who have served you this week. Rehearse the reasons to rejoice and you will enter into God's peace. Number two, lift your gaze to the return of Christ. Try your best to think outside of today and tomorrow and next week and cast your mind on the day when Christ will return and all of the wrong will be made right. That is a reality that's going to happen. Number three, displace your worry with requests. Maybe you need to just get on your knees after this and say, God, I've I repent for not, not really coming to you, just complaining and worrying and bickering and, and, and all those things, but not coming to you. And I want to come to you. And I want you to know what I'm going through. Well, church family, I hope uh, this morning's time spent together was well spent, that you are leaving uh, the moments that we got to share together, um, encouraged that you have some real deal ways to access the peace of God in the midst of maybe a perplexing time, whether it was in regards to what has happened and transpired in this church this week, or whether there's things outside of the church that are more of a heavy weight on you or maybe things in the future. Uh, my, my, my prayer, and I want to pray for you in the next few moments, is that, that God would make that peace real, that it would really surpass your understanding, that it would really guard your heart, your emotions, and your thoughts this next week so that you could be a calmed, joyful, resilient person in the midst of storm. So Father, we, we ask for that, Lord. Be with us. Make your presence come near to us by your Holy Spirit. God, for those who are sick and are in pain and feeling hopeless and stuck 
and tired. God, we pray that you would have come near them and bring healing. For those who are fearful and uncertain and waiting test results back, we pray that you would come near to them and bring hope. For those maybe who, who have other issues, financial or sin issues, temptation, relational, job, God, whatever, we pray that your presence will come near us by your Holy Spirit so we would have a change in our nature. Our emotions, our thoughts would become calmed as we enter into situations that aren't as calm. We need you, God. We cry out desperately for you, your Holy Spirit, to come and fill us again fresh with calmness and peace and joy and hope that comes from you. We need you, Lord, and we trust you. We rejoice in your salvation. We rejoice that you're coming back, and we rejoice that you invite us to be honest before you and ask because you are a good father. We love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church family, love you so much. Wish I could be with you. Please look out in the next few days for an email that will explain uh, how we're going to safely gather back together next Sunday. And uh, this next Wednesday, where we usually have prayer in person, we're going to change that to an online Zoom. And so look out for a link for that. Look forward to seeking the Lord with you online and just asking for God's continual presence and blessing in our community. Please let us know if you need anything. Reach out to me or the church for any financial assistance, groceries, DoorDash, runs for errands. Uh, We have people who can help, um, who can bless you. We have resources. We want to take care of you. Uh, whether you just need someone to pray for you, you need to call me, one of the pastors or church members, we are here for you. We see you. The Lord sees you. Um, and I look forward to the, the ways in which the Lord makes his peace real to you this next coming week. Love you, church family. God loves you more. Peace and grace.